2019 is turning out to be a rewarding year for investors. Fed clearly has changed the underlying color of the commentary. Liquidity is back and money is migrated, migrating back into emerging markets. But Warren Buffett often says that price is what you pay, value is what you get. So with market or with benchmark indices sitting at an all-time high, how does one really judge the valuations? How, how should one assess future returns? Because future returns are a function of the under, underlying price you pay. So to understand the current uh, market level and to sync it with market valuations, on this edition, I have none other than the Dean of Valuations, Professor Ashwat Damodaran. Professor, fantastic to have you back on ET now and thank you for joining us. Uh, my first question, Professor, really has to be centered around the fact that benchmark indices, both in India and in global markets, at least global major markets, are sitting at a record high. Now, when we started the year, nobody liked the market. Then by mid-March, few started liking the market. But now, everyone is on the same side of the board and where do you feel few don't like the markets? So what's going on? I describe the market as a pricing game. It's not about value, it's about pricing. And people ask what the difference is. I tell them that pricing is driven by mood and momentum and that mood and momentum can shift on a dot. I mean, you're absolutely right. On December 31st, if you talk to experts around the world, and I'm sure you had a few on ET or on CNBC or anywhere else you watch them, they were convinced the world was coming to an end, that after the last quarter of last year, we were headed for a collapse. And I've learned never to take experts at their word for a simple reason. They're trying to read the tea leaves on what the mood and momentum is. And the mood and momentum shifted as it always does. And just and again, it can shift in the other direction as well. So I recognize that this is just a passing phase, that this too shall pass. Professor, some would also argue that the root reason why markets are moving from strength to strength is a function of global liquidity, which is Fed now believes that they are unlikely to tighten. And that is a good enough reason for bond markets and equity markets to rally. Yeah, I also always maintain the Fed does not set interest rates. So that's that sets me apart from most people. I think we overwatch the Fed. We give it powers that it really doesn't have. I mean, remember, the only interest rate the Fed sets is basically the, the discount rate and at the most the Fed funds rate indirectly. It doesn't set any other rates. For, for the last couple of years, we've talked about, in fact, the last year and a half, there's been all this breast beating about how the Fed is going to pull back from quantitative easing, and it has. And guess what? Rates haven't risen. You know what drives interest rates? It's expected inflation and expected growth. So as long as those numbers stay muted, and they are globally, you're not going to see interest rates take off. You know what will cause interest rates to go up? It's not the Fed freaking out and raising rates. It's a fact that inflation is increasing or real growth is picking up. So this is not something that the Fed controls. So if the U.S. economy continues to stay strong, and the global economy starts to show signs of life, you're going to see interest rates go up. Uh, whether the Fed wants to or not is kind of irrelevant. The Fed, I've described the Fed as the Wizard of Oz. I mean, basically, like the Wizard of Oz, people think it has power, but the power it has comes from the perception it has power. It's a very elaborate perception game. And if the Fed's not careful, that perception will get stripped away. Now, last time when I interacted with you, Professor, you were of the view that a new reboot button has been pressed. And globally, trade war and implications of a trade war could be far-reaching. The Americans would like to normalize their economy and the Chinese would like to protect their exports. Uh, and given what we've heard from U.S. President Donald Trump, some would argue that the trade war fear for the moment have not receded at all. I think there is a recalibration in global trade. I think for a while, the, the perception was anything that increase, uh, increases global trade is good. But the consequences of that were, were, pretty, were, pretty, were, were not good for a lot of people in developed markets. Let's face it, both Brexit and the election of Donald Trump reflected a reality, which is globalization was great for the cities. It was terrible for the rest of the country. And this was true in the US, it's true in the UK, it's true in Europe, it's true in India. Globalization, the experts and the financial markets have always loved because it makes them much more prosperous. But it's had real cost for the rest of the economy. So what you're seeing, I think, is a recalibration where people are saying, okay, trade is good, but there, are good, there have to be some rules that people follow. And I'll be quite honest, the Chinese have never followed rules when it comes to global trade. So 
Personally, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm not a Donald Trump supporter per se, but I think what he's doing with the Chinese was long overdue because the Chinese essentially took the trade rules, pushed them to the limit, broke them, and knew that people cared so much about global trade that there'd be no pushback. So now that there's some pushback, I think you're getting a reality adjustment here, which is that global trade can't be unrestrained, where some people break the rules and essentially get away with it, and some people keep to the rules. So I think that this is perhaps something that is needed in the long-term shift towards a global, a, a global market, is a sense that rules matter for everybody. Now in the past, you've maintained that one of the reasons why U.S. Uh, markets are going higher is because the net earnings is moving higher, but that is also a function of buybacks. Do you think buybacks which have been at play, uh, where U.S. companies are not returning money back to the shareholders, but they're rewarding them with buybacks, could be a passe now, or do you think we are likely to see a string of buybacks moving forward as well? Well, I think there's going to be a pullback on buybacks, not to some lower level. The buybacks are here to stay. I think they're actually a healthier way to return cash than paying dividends. I've never understood this phenomenon of dividends because equity by definition is a residual claim. You're supposed to get whatever's left over. And for a company to claim that whatever's left over is going to be a fixed number every year always struck me as unnatural. So it's dividends that are unnatural, buybacks that actually make sense. So I think this phenomenon of shifting to buybacks for U.S. companies is here to stay. That's the first part. The second is, I think the, the companies that you see doing buybacks are those tech companies we talked about that are cash machines. If you're a cash machine like Apple, I mean, you can give back $50 billion in cash and still see your cash balance go up. So the second is the types of companies doing buybacks are doing it because they have so much cash coming in. Third, the buybacks that you saw in 2018 in the U.S. did have a push-up effect from the tax law changing. Prior to 2018 in the U.S., the, the U.S. tax code was a, was a perverse one because it, it looked at U.S. companies making money abroad and said, if you bring the money back to the U.S., we're going to tax you the extra tax rate. And guess what? All that money stayed outside the U.S. There was about $2 trillion in trapped cash at the start of 2018. The tax law entrapped that cash. So some of the buybacks you saw in 2018 reflected that cash returning. That portion of buybacks is going to go away. But that doesn't mean buybacks are going to drop back to some low number. They're going to stay at high levels relative to history because this is the way companies return cash. Professor, uh, let me draw your attention to what some of the global market gurus are indicating. From Ray Dalio to Stanley Miller to uh, Harvard Marks, the central view from some of these global gurus is that we are in a long bull market, the longest we've seen post Second World War and world has forgotten the importance of risk and a big crack or a crash is about to happen. Do you think we are in the last leg of this rather decade old bull market? I mean, let's start with the, with the one fact that we know it's been a long bull market. Everything else is supposition. Remember what I said about expert up front? I would say that about everybody, even very smart people, even Warren, I take everybody with a grain of salt. That includes a Warren Buffett, a Ray Dalio. Doesn't mean that what they're saying doesn't make sense. I think it's just as a market ages, you're going to get worried and you're going to get the, and you're going to get people wagging their finger saying, oh, there's going to be a correction. So let's start with the second reality. There will be a correction as there's in any market, bull market or not. And when that correction happens, you're going to see people wagging their fingers and say, I told you so. I've learned to ignore these people because in a sense, if you worry about what's happened already and you constantly worry about corrections, I've discovered it does more damage to your investments and your portfolio than letting it ride. I'm, I'm not a good market timer. I know there's going to be a correction, but I have no idea when it's going to happen. So you know what I need to do? I need to go out and pick good companies. I can't worry about where the market is and when the next correction is coming because I find it undercuts my investing. I've got to focus on what I, what, what I brought to the table. And I'm not a market timer. So as I listen to these people, I agree with them. It's an aging bull market. There will be a correction. Are there people there who've lost all sense of risk? Absolutely. There's nothing I can do about them. It's almost a karmic view, which is, hey, what will be, will be. There's nothing I can do about that correction when it comes. And to the degree that I worry about things I don't control, it's going to hurt me as an investor. Now, Professor, the dilemma for Indian investors is that Indian investors currently are stuck between rock and a hard surface, which is that one side you've got great companies, 
consumer companies, private banks, NBFCs, which are great businesses. They have a long-term moat around them or a moat around them. But they are available at valuations which may not be considered as the ideal hunting ground for value pickers. So what is your sense? Do you think we are staring at a new normal where one has to pay premium to go buy good businesses? Or at these levels, one should not lose oversight of the underlying valuation because ultimately your future returns are based on the level at which you buy securities. I think we need to separate good companies from good investments. That's absolutely true. If you buy a good company at too high a price, it's still a bad investment. I mean, it's uh, for those of you who've read, uh, for those people who've read my writings on Amazon, everybody knows I absolutely think that Amazon is perhaps the best run, you no know, most feared company on the face of the earth. That said, though, I've been in and out. I sold short on Amazon in September of last year. And I did it not because I didn't like them as a company. I absolutely, they're, they're still a great company. I thought they were not a great investment. So it's absolutely true. Good companies can be bad investments and bad, bad companies can be good investments. I own NVIDIA and GE in my portfolio. NVIDIA is a good company that's also a good investment. GE is a terrible company, but that's a good investment because I got it at the right price. So from that perspective, that's absolutely right. As an investor, you got to think about the price you pay as much as you think about how good a company is, because you need to get a company at the, at the right price for it to be a good investment. The other concern what naysayers have in India is that Indian markets are trading at a premium to the historical averages, and a mean reversion is something which could happen. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why, in general, the view on India has not been very positive. So what is your view? Will India be the special situation, uh, uh, special situation case because of the underlying uh, growth and promise of better governance or the mean revision for Indian stocks also is something which is inevitable? We worship at the altar what I call mean reversion. Mean reversion basically is a fancy way of saying we think will, things will revert back to the way they used to be. And you know what? It's not a bad strategy. It's, it works about 90% of the time until it doesn't. I'll tell you what you need for mean reversion to work, and 90% of investors do what you just described. They, when you buy low PE stocks, implicitly, what do you say? They'll revert back to the average. When you buy a stock that's trading at a lower price to book than historically, you're assuming it'll revert back to the average. The only problem is mean reversion works if you're in a structural model that's stable. In fact, most of the investing rules we have out there were developed in the US in the second half of the 20th century. And the reason I emphasize that is the second half of the 20th century, the U.S. market was the most stable mean reverting market of all time. The danger, though, is when structural models change, then mean reversion stops working. So when you look at, for instance, the Schiller PE, the Schiller PE looked like it worked really well for that century. That was the 20th century. There are still people out there who feel stocks are overpri overpriced and they use the Schiller PE to back it up. My reaction to them is the model might have changed and using the Schiller P or any other historical number as your basis for investing is extremely dangerous. So one thing I'd ask people to look at is whether they think the world today is different than it was 20, 40 or 50 years ago. And the answer is absolutely. And if the world is different, there is a danger here to assuming that history will repeat itself. Uh, Professor, you've always said that uh, it is perhaps difficult to look at uh, the cyclical nature of the market. So how does one really understand uh, buying into cyclicals, or, you know, balance sheets of corporate banks and especially some of the metal names because they are also a large part of the portfolio and if you really get the uh, cycle right, you may end up making uh, you know, good returns. I think that if you buy cyclical commodity companies to play the cycle, you're asking for trouble because the history of people predicting commodity price cycles is not a good one. When was the last time you had an oil price expert actually get a forecast right? I don't even know why we listen to these guys anymore. So I think when people play commodity and cyclical uh, companies trying to play the cycle, they are going to lose money over time. So if you're going to buy a cyclical company, buy it for the right reasons, which is it's a really good company and people have sold off on it too much during a recession. If you're buying an oil company, buy it for the same reasons, not because you think oil prices will come back, but because it looks cheap at today's oil price. So I think there are good reasons for buying commodity and cyclical companies and bad ones, and buying them because you think the cycle will turn, to me, is a bad reason. 
Professor, uh, the other criticism which uh, currently is prevalent in the world and both after two, 2008 financial crisis and 2013 taper tantrum and now at least in India after the LNFS crisis is the role some of the rating agencies are playing. Uh, some would argue that rating agencies are behind the curve and fund managers should not really optimize their investment decision based on what the rating agencies are indicating because that's not a true indicator of the current book quality or the availability or perhaps the potential uh, uh, you know cash flow of the company or the asset i i think ratings agency there are two words i would describe to, for ratings agencies one is they're always late to the punch it's not their fault they're built to be late right so when you see ratings change it's almost always after the fact the second is that ratings agencies are are filled with human beings just like the rest of us they caught up with remember the words i use mood and momentum they get caught up in the mood of the moment, just like the rest of us. So you can, I mean, there are, there are of course, people who are, who talk about the conflict of interest. I, I would argue that even if you took all the conflicts of interest up, that ratings agencies are still going to have the same problems that they have today in terms of being late and getting caught up in the mood of the moment. So here's my advice to investors. There is information in what ratings agencies tell you. So when I value a company, I do look up the bond rating. But trust, but verify. So basically, even if you have a bond rating for a company, you need to do your due diligence. You can't buy Tesla bonds just because S&P says those bonds are safe. You need to look at the numbers for Tesla and ask, hey, would I lend to this company? So for, for decades now, we've let the ratings agency be a crutch when we buy bonds. And I think we have to, we have to accept the fact that it's good to have a rating. But you need to do your due diligence still. And it's not difficult to do. We just have chosen not to do it. Uh, you know, last time when we spoke, you also alluded to the fact that uh, the Tata, the current uh, Tata Sons chairman, which is N. Chandra Shekharan, is trying to reboot the Tata Group. Tata Group in the past has suffered because of poor capital allocation. So do you think he's trying to climb a, a very tough mountain? Because his initial start was strong. But looking at uh, sure, where Tata Motors currently is stuck, what's happening to some other Tata group of companies, he's trying very hard. But you know, it's a situation of three step forward and one step back, or in this case, three step forward and two steps back. Yeah, I think that the lo the longer a, gr a company has been in existence, and the more the culture is set, the more difficult it becomes to create change at that group. And the Tata group has a very long and illustrious history. Let's not overlook that. It, it I mean, it helped build India as we know it today. So I think from that perspective, change was always going to be difficult. It was going to be three steps forward, two steps back. You saw the three steps forward which, uh, when, you, when Chandra first came in. And now you're probably seeing the two steps back where the bureaucracy fights back. But if you can keep the incremental change going and you keep it moving in the right direction, it's still progress. So I think the key for the Tata Group is to continue to work on change. And that's got to come from within. And I think that uh, you know, there will be incumbents who fight back and um, it'll, it'll be slow, but I, I'm still optimistic that change can come. Professor, so I'm going to ask you a hard one or a direct one. How do you think Indian investors should value a business like Reliance? Because Reliance is, is no longer a old stroke petrochemical company. Nearly 20% of the profits and more than 25% uh, of the projected profits in the next two years will come from the new businesses, which is retail and geo. So how does one understand the, the underlying valuation, what a company like Reliance has to offer? The heart of the business is still old economy, but the new business, which is the engine business for Reliance, is growing at a very rapid pace. Reliance has, you know, there are a couple of parts of Reliance, which I think are more options than businesses. Geo, for instance. I mean, clearly it's a cash drain for the company because so much cash goes in, but it has the potential to make Reliance into a new kind of company because there's hundreds of millions of people. Who knows what else you can do with them? So Reliance is an interesting company. Again, the petrochemicals part provides the cash flows. So if you think of it in the same terms that you think of Microsoft, they're using their cash generating businesses to create new businesses that they hope will create growth. The key, though, is that you've got to be careful about how you do that, because if you let your ego and your hope run away with you, you can end up losing a lot of money in new businesses. So what you're hoping for if you're a Reliance investor is that within the group, there's enough discipline in how they allocate capital, that when they allocate capital to these new businesses, it's being done sensibly. 
Now, the one concern you should have as an investor in Reliance is that corporate governance is very, very weak. You can't, as an outsider, do much to change the way Reliance operates itself. So if change happens and it's not good change, you're not going to be able to stop it. So it's a, it's a mixed blessing because having that kind of control over the company allows you to do interesting and new things. But having as much control as the Ambani's have over Reliance also means that as an investor, you're fairly helpless if they decide to take the company down the wrong path. How do you view the current current cleanup act in the Indian banking system? After NCLT and IBC laws, some would argue that the Indian the opaqueness in the Indian banking system has gone away. Uh, the entrepreneur now will have to have a serious uh, business proposition before he's able to draw money lines from the bank. Uh, do you think this is something which is going to change the dynamics of Indian banking sector, or this is like saying that? Uh, this is like saying that the culture will not change and uh, whatever approach or whatever laws which have been uh, which have been announced by government they may change the short term direction but the, not the long term prospects of the Indian banking sector because that banking sector is suffering with what could be called as a as a you know a culture crisis I think I'll, I'll, no, this, there is a lot of a lot of stuff in the in the financial service sector that needs to be shaken up because it goes back, I would say, not, not even decades, centuries. The way lending was done in India was through personal networks rather than through the traditional way of hey, does the business have the cash flows to pay off the debt? You lent to families, you didn't lend to companies, you lent to individuals that you thought were you know well connected, had the business, had the capacity to pay off the debt. So in a sense, some of that reckoning has to come, which is that old debt that you've been given to fam been giving to family groups or to old companies might need to be re-examined. So I'm not saying that there's no pain, but I think that part of that pain, you know, you've already started to feel in the last year or two, as you know, as you see the push towards the cleaning up of bank balance sheets, and you're going to see some surprises as these balance sheets get opened. But I think that. The process forward has to be that banks have to be independent from the companies that they lend to, because as long as those connections remain, you're always going to have this issue of, is this a loan based on financials or is this a loan based on personal connections? Now, without getting into who will be the next prime minister of India, and I'm going to keep the politics aside, what is your sense of, of some of the big measures which the government has undertaken you know both in terms of GST, IBC, uh, trying to uh, use the entire benefits of Aadhaar card to pass on subsidy benefits. Do you think these are long pending reforms and the route has been laid and now we potentially could be staring at a very large earnings recovery? I think there's been good change and bad change, but that could be said about any change. For instance, I thought demonetization did not was was too you know did not deliver the results given the pain it inflicted. So I think as as whatever the the next regime, the next government is, they have to make change, but they have to also consider the trade-off, which is all change is painful. So you got to ask: Is the reward that comes out of this change uh, this change going to compensate me for the pain? So I think, you know, I, uh, I credit the government for some of the changes they made because those changes were overdue. But at the same time, I think they got distracted by other changes that created more pain than gain. And I think that trade-off has to be considered more carefully going forward because, I mean, God knows we all need to change. The world is shifting around us and it's not just India. Every economy needs to change, reflect change, you know, the, uh, how how sh shifts are occurring and how we live our lives. So I think that um, I, you know, whatever the next regime is, I hope that when they look at change, they look at that pain gain trade off a little more carefully. All right, Professor, an absolute pleasure and, and a delight to have you back on ET now. Thank you for joining us and certainly look forward to interacting much more of you.